Thank you everyone for joining. Thank you, Dr. Wong, for accepting our invitation for today's grant rounds. Today's grant rounds is titled Hepatitis B Virus Infection and it's going to be hosted by Dr. Robert Wong. Dr. Robert Wong completed his medical training at UCSF and then continued his uh, internal medicine residency at California Pacific Medical Center and then uh, went to fellowship training in, at Stanford. He completed um, his fellowship at Stanford. Uh, he is currently part of the Division of Gastroenterology and Hepatology at Stanford, where he also holds the title of Assistant Clinical Professor. Uh, Dr. Wang's research interest revolves around complex hepata hepata hepatic disease, sorry, viral hepatitis, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and uh, liver transplant-related outcomes. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Wang. You can begin. Great, thank you. Thanks so much for the introduction and welcome everyone. It's my pleasure today to give a talk on hepatitis B infection. Uh, this is an overview talk. Um, you know, each topic itself can really turn into a very uh, detailed discussion. So this will be more of a overview of the general approach to hepatitis B uh, infection. The objectives will be to understand the epidemiology of chronic hepatitis B. And we'll also talk about some of the guideline recommendations on who you should screen for hepatitis B, understand the initial evaluation and management, and then we're gonna use a case to sort of illustrate some of the important points that I wanted to bring across. So we'll start with the case. Uh, this is a 50-year-old man wanting to establish care in your clinic. He has history of hypertension, not on any medications, and he actually hasn't seen a provider in over 20 years. Family history is notable for hypertension. His social history is, as you can see here, he has a 20-pack year smoking history. He's a, quote, social drinker, denies drug use. He's a retired high school teacher, and he actually emigrated from Vietnam to the U.S., about 20 years ago, and he is in a stable monogamous relationship. The first question I wanted to ask you to think about is whether or not this person needs to be screened for hepatitis B. And the choices are A, no, he does not have any risk factors that warrant routine screening. B, yes, we should screen for hepatitis B, and we should screen with hepatitis B surface antibody only. If he's positive, that means he's immune. And if negative, then we can vaccinate. Or C, we should screen for hepatitis B and order all three of these tests, which include surface antibody, surface antigen, and core antibody IgG. So I'll give you a few moments to think about that. So the correct answer should be C. And hopefully in the subsequent slides, I'll be able to help illustrate to you why this is the correct answer, what these different serologies mean, and how to interpret the combination of positive or negative hepatitis B serologies. First talk a little bit about epidemiology. Uh, hepatitis B is really a global epidemic and recent estimates report over 250, 260 million adults chronically infected worldwide. As many of you may know, the highest burden of chronic hepatitis B is seen in the Asia Pacific regions and also Sub-Saharan Africa. In the US, recent estimates uh, report about two to 2.4 million chronic hepatitis B patients in the US. Um, of which over 70% are foreign born. So it is really a very much an international disease and illness that we all need to be very cognizant of. Most importantly, over four, uh, up to 40% of chronic hepatitis B patients can develop complications, including acute exacerbation or reactivation, cirrhosis, and hepatocellular carcinoma or liver cancer. And that's why it's so important for the early diagnosis, linkage to treatments to prevent disease progression to these complications. 
This is a, a, a global map to show you the burden of hepatitis B. The darker the color represents higher prevalence of hepatitis B. And I know this is a very much an international audience, so I think it's so important to really see and understand where some of the burden of hepatitis B uh, uh, arises. And as you can see here, Sub-Saharan Africa, a lot of the Asia Pacific region, and also parts of South America have really high prevalence of hepatitis B. It's important to understand this because it really drives home the main message of education, raising awareness, and timely screening so we can diagnose these patients, monitor, and plug them into appropriate monitoring and management. Despite this high burden, this is a, a, a um, graph I took out from a recent paper in Lancet GI published in 2018 from the Polaris Hepatitis B group that shows not only the burden of hepatitis B, but the significant disparities in diagnosis, linkage to care, and treatment. As you can see here in the first column, it really shows the burden of hepatitis B, as we mentioned earlier, almost 300 million adults affected. But let me draw you to the third bar here and show you the great disparity. Of this huge burden of hepatitis B, we know that only a fraction of those have been diagnosed and are aware of their disease. The other important thing to, to highlight here is of those that are eligible for treatment, and we'll talk a little bit uh, uh, later about eligibility, but of those that are eligible, you can see here again, this stark disparity that only a fraction of those are on treatments. And this cascade or disparity in cascade really drives home the important message that we need to do a better job uh, globally in screening, identifying hepatitis B and getting them evaluated for timely antiviral treatments. Some da data specifically for the US, and this can be uh, is, is seen in many different regions in the world, but just sort of highlights what I mentioned previously about this cascade in patients that are undiagnosed and not being plugged into treatments. This is a bit older data from about five years ago, but show that among the 2.2 million uh, adults in the US with hepatitis B, uh, we know that one, only a fraction of them are aware of their infection, and, and particularly uh, only a much smaller fraction are actually on antiviral therapy. Again, driving home the importance that some of the complications of hepatitis B are preventable, but it really relies on the importance of timely diagnosis, timely linkage to care, and timely treatment so we can prevent disease progression and downstream liver-related complications. So then who, who should we screen? Um, the, the, there are lots of different guidelines, um, and I know this is an international audience, so you know, ESO guidelines for Europe, Apostle for Asia Pacific, um, but this is one that we use in the US, and I just wanna highlight the progression of screening recommendations that have occurred over the years. These are different societies and bodies uh, uh, that make recommendations on screening and practice. This is a US Preventative Services Task Force, American College of Physicians, the CDC. And then most recently, the most updated guidelines were about two or three years ago from the American Association for the Study of Liver Diseases. And I'm not going to read all of these different categories uh, uh, to you, but it just highlights the, our, 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 our understanding and progression of our knowledge of hepatitis B and emphasizing the importance of expanding the group of individuals that need to be screened. And given the international audience of this group, I just wanna point out the first line here that individuals born in regions with greater than 2% prevalence uh, are recommended to be screened for hepatitis B in the US. And, and why is that important? Well, I'm just gonna flip back to the map that I showed you earlier. Greater than 2% prevalence, really anything that is not gray. So all of this region, Asia Pacific, all of Africa 
most of, of South America. And so it, it, I know many of the individuals joining this call are from these regions. And really, if you're in this region, really universal hepatitis B screening uh, may be a reasonable approach to try and diagnose these patients earlier. So I'm just gonna, not gonna read through this, but this is just for your reference about different high-risk groups that we look at to screen uh, for hepatitis B in the US. But the main driver is country of origin as well as risk factors. How do we um, approach hepatitis B um, in terms of eradicating uh, this disease globally? Well, the goal of eradicating hepatitis B relies on two important concepts of prevention and engagement. In prevention, we think about in screening and vaccination. So screening and vaccinated those who don't have immunity. And when we talk about engagement, it's really about linkage to care, educating patients, educating providers, and, and bridging that knowledge to get them plugged into care and plugged into treatment. And it's so important uh, uh, that we, that to focus on both aspects uh, in order to adequately and comprehensively address the burden of hepatitis B. Just one example, I know there's a lot of world regions that have implemented vaccination programs throughout the decades, but just one um, example that shows the, uh, how successful a vaccination program can be in addressing prevention. Uh, this is the Taiwan experience that has been published. Um, as many of you know, Taiwan launched a nationwide Hep B vaccine program in 1984. Uh, also infants born to E antigen positive mothers uh, with chronic hepatitis B receive uh, hepatitis B immunoglobulin. They studied this cohort prospective and longitudinally uh, over 3,300 patients and they reported their data after 25 year follow-up. This is really the take home point here. And it shows how a vaccination program really changes disease epidemiology and can be a really public health initi uh, initiative to address a large uh, uh, problem. And as you can see here, the different um, lines on the graph represent different time periods that they evaluated these patients. 1984, uh, sorry, just to orient you, the y-axis shows the surface antigen prevalence, and the x-axis here shows the age of the individuals that they evaluated. The reference uh, line here is 1984, and this is where they started vaccinating individuals and in implementing uh, HBIG uh, immunoglobulin. And as you can see here over time, there's two um, big patterns to see. Number one, you see the drop in prevalence of hepatitis B. You see the drop after initiation of, of vaccination programs. And also over time, you see the, the, the shift in the age of individuals, because these are individuals here that uh, were probably born before 1984. So they were, were not part of the vaccination program at that time. So implementing vaccines decrease the chronic hepatitis B prevalence. And you can see here really shifts and makes a big difference in preventing hepatitis B uh, in, in early life. Second big important aspect of this, as many of you know, hepatitis B is a major contributor to liver cancer worldwide. And you can see here in this graph where they looked at different time periods. So 1973 to 79, 79 to 84. And then after they implemented the vaccine program in 1984 to 1998, they looked at different uh, age ranges. And the main point I wanna draw your attention and your eyes to is this column here, where it shows the liver cancer incidence. 0 0.5, 0 0.47, and then bam, look, after vaccination program, there's actually a drop in liver cancer. So this is amazing. And we see this in all the age groups. You see here age six to nine, 10 to 14, 15 to 19. So not only are we preventing hepatitis B, but in many ways, this is a cancer vaccine. It really led to reduced 
incidence of liver cancer. And you can see here the uh, multivariate regression, it's a 3.3, which means a 70% reduction in liver cancer. And this was seen across different age ranges. So it really shows the importance of a public health initiative in implementing vaccine can make a big difference in disease epidemiology of hepatitis B. Now I'm gonna jump a little bit. I know there's a broad audience uh, that's viewing these talks. So I wanna uh, talk a little bit about some of the background of hepatitis B and understand modes of transmission. In general, we think of three major routes of transmission, vertical transmission, horizontal, and adult acquired infections. In most of the world, hepatitis B is acquired through perinatal or vertical transmission from mother to child. And that's why it's so important, um, such as the previous study I talked about, in implementing screening for hepatitis B in mothers, and then implementing vaccination and hepatitis B immunoglobulin early in life can lead to significant reductions in hepatitis B and hepatitis B-related outcomes. Horizontal uh, transmission can also be um, a, a, a route of a, a transmit, uh, transmission of hepatitis B uh, through early childhood um, exposure and breaks in skin. And then in countries like the US, um, you know, domestic cases are really adult acquired and may be contributed by IV drug use, potentially sexual transmission. Uh, and these are predominantly seen in low prevalence regions. But again, most of the world, uh, the major contributor to hepatitis B burden is due to perinatal or vertical transmission. This is just a, a, a little picture that I um, created to show the natural history of hepatitis B. When one acquires acute hepatitis B infection, you can see here the majority of patients are subclinical. Only a fraction of those actually pre present as clinically uh, a noticeable and symptomatic disease. And this really highlights the silent killer uh, aspect of hepatitis B, that many acquire it unknowingly or have it and potentially carry it uh, for many years before it's actually diagnosed, and hence the importance of <clears throat> implementing routine screening. Once someone develops acute hepatitis B, there's really two main routes, whether they clear it or they develop chronic hepatitis B infection. We know from natural history and epidemiology that's really driven by immunology that those that acquire it, acquire it early in life due to vertical transmission, the vast majority of these patients do develop chronic hepatitis B infection and hence the importance of screening for hepatitis B in world regions where there's a very high prevalence of this disease. And then those that acquire early in life, such as through adult IV drug use, for example, uh, most of them clear it. Uh, only a small proportion of these actually develop chronic infection. Of course, there's a lot of confounders that can lead to this. For example, if you have HIV co-infection, you're relatively immunosuppressed. So then even if you acquire it as an adult through IV drug use, for example, your rates of developing into chronic infection are much higher. These rates of uh, progression to chronic uh, versus clearance are really a manifestation of uh, the body's immune system. And that's why infants that acquire early in life don't have a very mature immune system and hence develop chronic infection much more commonly than adults that, that uh, acquire hepatitis B. Again, we talked about uh, natural history. Uh, some patients recover without uh, sequelae of disease. And how can we distinguish um, a, a, a hepatitis B infection versus uh, uh, in, uh, vaccination developed immunity, it's really the core antibody. And I'm gonna go over this in a little bit later to really help us understand how to interpret some of these different hepatitis B serologies. But even in those that clear it, so for example, even adults that acquire it and clear it because they have a, a mature immune system, Many studies demonstrate, demonstrate that there are persistent hepatitis B DNA and hep B specific cytotoxic T cells that persist in both the serum and liver tissue more than 15 years after 
recovery. And that's a very unique aspect of hepatitis B that's contrasted with hepatitis C, for example. It's a DNA virus, it's integrated, and this integrated CCC DNA is very difficult. And many think, at least in the current era of therapies, nearly impossible to completely eradicate for, from, from our system after we've been exposed or infected. This is also important because even in someone that has supposedly cleared or suppressed DNA, uh, hepatitis B DNA, there is risk of reactivation when there's exposure to stress or medications such as steroids or immunosuppression can really allow hepatitis B to reactivate. And in those situations can lead to a flare or liver failure. We see this particularly in patients uh, with uh, different types of cancer. They're exposed to very high potency immunosuppression, such as anti-CD20 agents like rituximab carry a high risk of reactivation of hepatitis B. The, uh, the controversy here is those that develop uh, self-mediated suppression. It's not really clear, and we really need better long-term studies to understand the long-term consequences of having persistent so-called latent uh, hepatitis B virus. This is a cartoon that really helps uh, illustrate some of the big differences between hepatitis B and other common viruses that we interact with, including hepatitis C and HIV. The distinguishing features of hepatitis B, as you mentioned, hepatitis B is a DNA virus. And because of that, it has carcinogenic potential and can integrate into our genome into something called CCC DNA that makes it nearly impossible to eradicate with our current uh, repertoire of therapies. The other important thing to, to note, unlike hep C, which can be eradicated with current antiviral therapies, current therapies we have for hepatitis B do a great job at suppressing the virus. But for the time being, we have not been able to develop a so-called cure for hepatitis B, and hence the importance of lifelong therapy. Here are the sero serologic markers that I mentioned. <clears throat> These are the five ones that I think it's important to identify. Surface antigen is the most important and what we typically use to screen for hepatitis B. It's a marker of chronic infection. So I like to teach our house staff to think about serologies and, and different keywords. So surface antigen is a marker of infection. And we, uh, we identify, we, um, the definition of this is persistence of beyond six months identifies chronic infection. Surface antibody or anti-HBS is a marker of immunity. So key word here is if you have surface antibody, you're immune, so to speak. So surface antigen is infection, surface antibody is immunity, and then core antibody, the key word here is exposure. Anyone that has been exposed to hepatitis B, regardless of clearance or chronic infection, if you're exposed, you will be core antibody positive. So that's a very important way to distinguish someone that has been vaccinated versus exposure. Because if you're just vaccinated without hepatitis B exposure, your core antibody here should be negative. You can develop surface antibody indicating immunity, but if you have not been exposed to hepatitis B, your core antibody here should be negative. So very important concept to think about when you evaluate hepatitis B serologies. Of course, the DNA indicates active virus and a measure of replication. The antigen is also important in helping us define infectivity, active replication, whether this is a native, uh, uh, native virus versus a mutant virus. And also, as you will, um, I will touch on briefly, um, it's an important consideration for starting antiviral therapy. These are, as I mentioned, once you're infected with uh, hepatitis B, there's really two main outcomes, whether you have acute infection with recovery or develop of chronic infection. And I just have two pictures and graphs here to illustrate the uh, serology profile that helps distinguish these two states. The top graph here shows someone that has acute infection who develops recovery. How can we see that? Well, look here, surface antigen, you're exposed. So bam, you have acute infection, but this is someone that is, uh, is able to suppress and recover the virus, uh, recover from the virus. 
So you have a bump in your surface antigen, and then look at this, it comes down and then becomes undetectable. So this is someone that has recovered. Because they recovered, now they develop here, you can see here, surface antibody. So they've recovered and now they have immunity. Other thing to draw your eyes to, I wouldn't focus too much on the top. I would just focus on this line here. This is the core antibody. Remember IgM is acute and IgG is sort of chronic exposure. So someone is affected with acute hepatitis B, you see this, bam, the IgG goes up and particularly the IgM. But because this graph shows the, someone that has recovered, the acute infection recovers, surface antigen declines, and also IgM declines. But remember what I said earlier, core antibody is an indicator of exposure. So this individual has been exposed to hepatitis B, and that's why you see here, the core antibody total or IgG persists. And it will always persist because once someone's exposed, it, you can't really change, oops, sorry. You can't really change, uh, you can't really change that fact that they have been previously exposed. I wanna contrast that with here, someone that has developed chronic infection. This person has the same profile. You have acute infection, but the difference here is that this person has persistent surface antigen indicating chronic infection. So you see here, bam, this rises and the surface antigen persists indicating chronic infection. Again, IgM, bum, goes up. And remember, IgM is only seen in an acute uh, time period. So IgM also goes up and goes down, but core antibody persists. So you can tell here, when you look at a cross section of th these labs here, this person has persistent surface antigen, persistent core antibody. So this means they're exposed, core means exposed, and they have chronic infection. Whereas if we contrast it here, this person has core, core meaning exposed, but they have immunity because they have surface antibody. So just think about that. I know sometimes uh, that can be a little bit confusing. We're gonna revisit that one more time in the next slide. Here are the serologies. So um, you know, usually in a live audience, this will be a little bit of a quiz so <laughs> that we can ask people uh, to, to, to answer, but uh, you know, even the virtual format, it's a little bit tricky. So just think to yourself, and you know, if you're in a classroom with other people, you can also talk out loud with your partners uh, and, and, and think about this. Um, but I'm gonna go ahead and talk out loud and, 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 and illustrate my thinking and rationale with these serologies. Remember, surface antigen means infection. Surface antibody means immunity. Core antibody means exposure. So infection, immunity, exposure. So think about this first line here. This person has never been exposed, so no exposure. They don't have infection and they have immunity. So what do you guys think this would represent? No exposure, no infection and immunity. So yeah, this is someone that has been vaccinated. They're vaccinated, immune, and that's why they haven't shown any exposure. Second scenario, think through this. This is someone that has core antibody, so they're exposed, surface antibody, they're immune, and they don't have surface antigen. So exposed, immune, but no chronic infection. So what does that mean? Well, this is similar to the first graph we showed in the previous slide. This is someone that has been infected, but has recovered. Um, could, we can't tell here, you know, this could be from, um, um, could be from self-immunity, but it could also be antiviral therapy. But in any case, this is what that means. Second one, this is easy. So negative, negative, negative. Never been exposed, of course, don't have immunity and no infection. So never infected, of course, that means they need to be vaccinated. Third one, I mean, a uh, fourth one, positive, negative, positive. So positive core, so they've been exposed. They don't have immunity and surface antigen indicates they have chronic infection. 
What does this mean? Exposed, known immunity, chronic infection. So this person has chronic infection with hepatitis B. The last one here is tricky. So I'll just give you maybe uh, 50, uh, 30 seconds or so to think about this one. Um, this is someone has core antibody positive. So they're exposed, but look at this. They're exposed, but they don't have immunity and they also don't have infection. So I'll give you a few seconds to think about what this potentially means. It's actually relatively common that we see this scenario. Um, and it's important to think about because it could represent a few different uh, potential cases. So it's a tricky one. Um, definitely the one scenario that you really need to make sure you evaluate is whether this represents a cult hepatitis B infection. What I mean by that, this is someone that has hepatitis B, but because it's a very low level infection, whether it's their immune system um, or some variant of hepatitis B, that it's not the, 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 the amount of virus is not high enough to generate a positive surface antigen. So these are people you really need to check. If you have an isolated core, you should check the hepatitis B DNA to make sure this is not a cult low level chronic infection. That's the main thing you have to rule out. If that's negative, then you can potentially also check quantitative surface antigen in some regions of the world that's available. Uh, really, you want to make sure you're not missing chronic infection, uh, occult chronic infection in these patients. Then I'm going to move on to talk a little bit. This one, this graph here is a little bit more complicated, but I just wanted to introduce the concept for you to dwell on a little bit. Once we diagnose someone with chronic hepatitis B, the next step is really thinking about what stage of disease they are in. And in general, we break it into four uh, phases or stages of disease. And there's different names depending on the, the guideline or the world region that you're, you live and practice in. But in general, we think about the stages of immune tolerance, immune active, low replication, or reactivation. And you can see here, I'm not going to dwell on this in detail, but this is the combination of different markers that you can see. But I just want to explain what these mean. So the first stage of disease is immune tolerance, and it's implied by the name tolerance. You can see here that the virus is present, so hepatitis B viral DNA is high, but because the body is tolerant of it, and usually this is seen early in life in someone that hasn't developed a very mature immune system, it's tolerant, so the body doesn't really generate a flare of ALT. There's no, no hepatitis, there's a circulating DNA, and the body just goes, oh, okay, well, I'm not going to really pay attention to the virus. This can last for, it just depends on a variety of factors, but can last for many, many years. At some point, either a trigger or a stress or the immune system starts to recognize the foreign DNA, and you can see here, bam, the body immune system becomes activated and tries to really get rid of the, this virus. So you see this up and down, up and down. It's really a battle between your immune system and the virus. And you see a flare of the hepatitis B. This is the body and the liver trying to eradicate the virus. So there's a flare, there's hepatitis. There can be some liver injury as a result. And you can see here that the hepatitis B DNA is slowly being suppressed. And in some patients, it reaches this low replication stage. If the immune system is successful in suppressing the virus, you reach this sort of plateau where everything sort of calms down. Your body did a good job. It's suppressing the virus. The DNA level is not undetectable, but it drops to a low level that kind of hovers there. Your body is keeping it in check. ALT, liver recovers, hepatitis resolves, and hence we have this chronic infection but a low replication state. And in some patients later in life, age, time, stress, infection also 
uh, immunosuppression, as we mentioned, it can lead to a reactivation. So this is a flare of the disease that can sometimes lead to really significant liver injury, liver failure, um, and in some cases, even death. So that's in general, the sort of big picture overview of the different stages of hepatitis B that we think about. So back to the case, um, remember this was a 60 year old Vietnamese man uh, establishing care. <clears throat> we do decide to screen him for hepatitis B. Remember we, we went over the different serologies. So uh, hopefully the tests that, that, we, that you thought about to order are the correct ones. So this is what his tests show. He has service antigen positive, service antibody negative, core IgG positive, AST 70, ALT 100. So how do you interpret this? Uh, remember, core is exposure. So this one uh, patient has been exposed and they don't have immunity, but they have chronic infection. So this person likely has chronic hepatitis B infection. ALT is 100, what is normal? Remember uh, guidelines, the recent guidelines suggest that for men, normal should be less than 30 to uh, you know, 30 to 35. And then for women should be less than <clears throat> 25 to 30 or so. So even for this man, 100 is clearly uh, elevated and represents some degree of hepatitis. Once we diagnose hepatitis B, what are the next steps? Well, I can go on for many hours uh, about how to manage hepatitis B. But just from a big picture, I think there are three key concepts that you want to think about. Number one, evaluate the severity. How severe is the hepatitis B? Number two, does this person need to be treated? And then number three, does this person need liver cancer screening? Liver cancer screening is something I'm very passionate about because if you diagnose liver cancer early, just like hepatitis B, there are effective therapies that you can implement. So I'm gonna go through quickly those three concepts as a brief overview. When we're thinking about evaluation of severity, one way we can, uh, one aspect we can think about is evaluating liver fibrosis. I'm not gonna go over all these different tests in detail, but this is just to give you a big picture overview of different ways you can evaluate for liver fibrosis. Of course, the most direct way is liver biopsy, but that's invasive. And for the most part, we have non-invasive means to assess fibrosis in the current era. Uh, these could be serology-based uh, biomarkers or imaging-based biomarkers such as elastography. Even with liver biopsy though, as illustrated in this, um, uh, uh, this example, even liver biopsy itself has limitations. So this shows uh, three potential areas where someone can have gotten a liver biopsy. And depending on your sample selection, you can see that there's a variation in what disease can be identified. If they happen to capture this area, really it shows no fibrosis. If they happen to capture this area, really you see bridging fibrosis here, the bridging uh, stain of these uh, uh, fibrotic area, which indicates uh, cirrhosis. Um, or if you capture this area, you might see some more mild disease. Uh, you can see some steatosis here, but definitely more mild than say here. So liver biopsy, we still consider the gold standard, but this is just to illustrate that it's not without its own limitations as well. Different non-invasive tests, serologies are available, APRI score, FIB4, all these different other ones. Um, for your reference, this is a really nice website it's a University of Washington website developed initially for hepatitis C, um, but there's a lot of good clinical calculators here um, that help you calculate non-invasive fibrosis score, where you just plug in these different parameters, you know, age, AST platelets, different, uh, different laboratory parameters, and it can easily provide an online calculator to, to generate the, the fibrosis score for each of these tests. Fiber scan is probably the more common elastography uh, method available. Um, not going to go into detail, but really it tell, fiber scan can be used to provide two important uh, data points. Uh, for some reason, this one doesn't, uh, I don't see it. Uh, maybe I got cut off, but it doesn't show it here. But the first thing it can capture is something called a CAP score. So the controlled attenuation parameter, 
which is an objective measure uh, to quantify hepatic fat content. And then most importantly is here, the, the, the liver stiffness measurements. And the liver stiffness measurement can give you an um, indirect assessment of liver fibrosis. Depending on the score, it can correlate with degree of fibrosis. So for example, this person has a very, very low score, 2.8 root, really indicates no significant fibrosis uh, that is present. Another test that actually is more accurate, but unfortunately less available, is MR elastography. So I'm not going to go into too much detail, but a lot of places don't have access to MR elastography. But for those places that do, um, there are a lot of studies that show that MRE uh, correlates very well with liver biopsy and has, is perhaps uh, the most accurate of the different imaging-based modalities to assess hepatic fibrosis. This is really just a summary table that highlights the different uh, modalities that are available for assessing fibrosis, whether it's non-invasive tests like the APRI or FIB4, FibroSure or FibroTests are proprietary blood-based uh, 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 markers, imaging such as elastography or liver biopsy. And this table shows you the you know, different pros and cons of these different modalities um, in, in comparing their accuracy for identifying cirrhosis, potential complications, uh, limitations. And then uh, something I like to think about a lot is cost and healthcare, healthcare resource utilization. So you can see here the elastography and liver biopsy uh, do carry a cost. And that's why a lot of times I like to use the uh, non-invasive serology markers such as fi uh, fibrosis 4 score, because for the most part, they're, um, they're, they're relatively accurate um, and it's very low cost because it's, it just uses the data that you already have from doing routine laboratory monitoring. Other ways to assess, uh, when, uh, other ways to think about <clears throat> severity of disease, um, chronic hepatitis B infection really can lead to long-term complications. And those are the things that we're trying to prevent with diagnosis and treatments. And that includes cirrhosis, hepatic decompensation, <clears throat> and of course, liver cancer or paracellular carcinoma. When thinking about cirrhosis, overall five-year risk to cirrhosis is about 12 to 20 percent in, in natural history studies. What are risk factors? Those with high viral load and, of course, the duration infection. The longer you've had it, the higher your risk of developing cirrhosis. Many other things that can increase your risk. Um, of course, anything that also um, injures or affects the liver will increase your risk of developing fibrosis or cirrhosis. For example, someone that has concurrent alcoholic associated liver disease, if you have HIV or hep C, and then something that's becoming more and more uh, 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 a hot topic nowadays is if you have concurrent Delta, hepatitis Delta infection. There's some data perhaps that tobacco smoking also increases disease progression uh, to cirrhosis and liver cancer, um, but you know, not as much data as some of these other hepato uh, um, liver related uh, concurrent infections. Hepatic decompensation. So as many of you may have seen already, you know, this is some of the coming in with uh, pretty massive ascites. This is a picture from an endoscopy that showed someone that has pretty large esophageal varices. Once someone <clears throat> develops cirrhosis, the development of decompensated disease is quite high. Five-year risk is about 20 to 30 to 30%. Once someone develops decompensated disease, the mortality risk is quite high. One-year survival uh, is, all, is about 50 to 70% for these patients that develop decompensation. Things we look at, jaundice, scleroecterus, <clears throat> portal hypertension, ascites, as you can see here, and GI bleeding from esophageal varices. So all of these things go into our assessment of severity of disease when we initially evaluate these patients uh, with chronic hepatitis B. Liver cancer, annual risk of uh, liver cancer among patients with hepatitis B uh, is about 2.5%. Um, and, oops, oh, oh, here we go. Interesting, other interesting thing to note though is that 25 to 30% of patients with hepatitis B related HCC actually don't have cirrhosis. 
And this goes back to remember we talked about hepatitis B being a DNA virus, integrates, so it has carcinogenic potential. So it's so important to, to think about <clears throat> hepatitis B and HCC screening as well in these individuals. Survival depends on stage of disease. The earlier the, you catch the cancer, the more effective therapies that are available, of course. So again, the, the importance of highlighting timely screening for liver cancer in hepatitis B patients. Um, um, I have data here from the US that show, despite all the improvements we've had uh, with uh, different uh, detection modalities and treatments, five-year survival remain, remains less than 30%. And this is due to poor, poor screening and very, um, I would say what we can do a better job in is improving screening for early diagnosis. And that's, I think, a, a, I think a point that um, can, be, can be made across different world regions, not just in the US. As I mentioned, early detection is so important uh, among hepatitis B patients. And this is just a summary graph that highlights or uh, summarizes some of what I've talked about disease progression from chronic infection, the risk of HCC, <clears throat> risk of cirrhosis. And you can see here that while the risk is lower, the risk is still there. You can still develop liver cancer in patients without cirrhosis. Of course, if you have cirrhosis, the risk is much, much higher, um, but still so important to think about here, the role, of H the role that HCC plays in the disease epidemiology of hepatitis B. Other thing that's very important, this is a graph pulled out from a, a, a landmark paper in JAMA 2006 from the hepatitis B reveal study. And this shows a very key point that, that we mentioned earlier, that virus level directly correlates with risk. You can see here in the graph on the left, the higher the virus level, the higher your risk of cirrhosis. And similarly, the higher your virus level, the higher the risk of liver cancer. So, and as a consequence, so important to identify these patients early. And by, uh, by correlate, if you can suppress the virus with antiviral therapy, you therefore reduce your risk of developing uh, cirrhosis and liver cancer. Jumping back to our case, so we did evaluate this patient. He turns out to be E antigen positive. He has a relatively high viral load, HIV negative. These are his labs here. So you can see here, very normal platelet count, normal albumin, normal INR. Does he have cirrhosis? Well, hard to tell for sure, 100% for sure, but based on his labs, he has a very intact synthetic function. So I would say this is unlikely to have cirrhosis. Does he need HCC screening? And who are you gonna screen with? So this is a key point. And I'm gonna bring us to the guidelines. Again, different world regions have different guidelines. We in the US use the AASLD, uh, American Association for a Study of Liver Disease Guidelines, which recommends that all patients with cirrhosis need screening. I mean, that's, you can't argue with that. We, we know that all patients with cirrhosis need screening. Here's the part that I think deserves more attention and more research. And primarily because we don't have a lot of good data and this has a room for improvement. I, I showed you that even in patients without cirrhosis, there is a risk of developing liver cancer, but there's some lack of clarity about who to screen. The current guidelines suggest that Asian or black flash African-American men should be screened starting at age 40. Even without cirrhosis, you should start at age 40. Asian women should start at age 50. If you have a first degree family member with liver cancer, you should screen. And then if you have a Delta, hepatitis Delta co-infection, <clears throat> you should also screen. But this leaves out a lot of groups. So, you know, what about black or African-American women? What about individuals from South America? So there's not a lot of information here. Um, and currently there's not enough data to recommend screening in those cohorts. Um, and at least for the ASLD guidelines, really this is what is recommended. Um, there are other guidelines and older guidelines that may recommend different things, but clearly this is an area where we need more data 
particular, particularly from the African continent, um, particularly from South America, so we can better understand the natural history, the risk factors, and better risk stratify who needs screening, who doesn't, so we can really improve our approach to caring for these patients with hepatitis B. What do we screen with? Well, most, mostly ultrasound um, with or without alpha beta protein. <clears throat> there are some other uh, biomarkers that are available now that I don't have time to talk about, but some of you, if you have time, you can read about. Uh, there's something called the GALAD score, G-A-L-A-D. There's some recent papers published about the performance of GALAD score for early detection of HCC. It's not quite in the guidelines yet, but I suspect this will make its way into the guidelines uh, very soon. This is just an image to show you uh, HCC. You know, when you identify something with ultrasound, to confirm the diagnosis, you need a multi-phase CT scan. And this shows you the four-phase CT scan with no enhancements, arterial enhancement, the portal venous phase, and then the venous washout or equilibrium phase. You can see here the unique feature about HCC is it's very hypervascular and arterial enhancing. So you see here in the arterial phase, the liver cancer here lights up. But remember from your anatomy that the, the, the liver is supplied primarily by what vessel? is supplied by the portal vein. Uh, so the, the liver itself lights up in the portal venous space, but the tumor is primarily supplied by hepatic artery. And that's why you see this contrast where arterial phase, the liver light, I mean, the tumor lights up, but the liver does not. And then in the portal venous phase, the liver lights up. And then in the washout, you get this um, hypovascular area where the, the tumor is. So that's a very characteristic feature of HCC. And that's why unlike many tumors, HCC can, the diagnosis can be made without liver biopsy, which is pretty fascinating that you can definitively diagnose HCC purely with risk factors, uh, confirmatory imaging without the need for liver biopsy. So very important point to make. What do we treat? Well, I'm not going to dwell on this, um, but I just wanted to emphasize key points that really when we think about treatment, my bias is probably everyone should be treated, but the guidelines are not there. Um, guidelines really say you, you think about a variety of features such as stage of disease, grade of disease, and really based on these different uh, lab-based markers of disease, uh, you think about who needs to be treated. I'm just going to flash up the next table here. I know it's going to be overwhelming and a lot of information, but this is just you know to give you a snapshot. You can always look this up later. I show here three different guidelines. The most recent ones, the European guidelines. This is the um, uh, what is this? The Asian American Treatment Algorithm, and then AASLD, uh, the American guidelines. And you can see here, it's really complex, um, but really it boils down to whether you're cirrhosis, whether you're cirrhotic, whether you're E-angine positive or negative, and then different combinations of your DNA or ALT level. And really the key point here is that if you have active disease, active uh, uh, hepatitis, active replication, the more likely you should be treated. And then if you have a very advanced disease, um, you should be treated. You know, the bar might be shifting. And in many situations, um, I think that even if you don't meet these strict criteria, uh, there may be still a benefit of implementing an antiviral therapy. What is the point of antiviral therapy? Well, there's a lot of goals that we are trying to achieve. Of course, big picture, we're trying to reduce hepatitis B complications. And that includes cirrhosis, that includes HCC. We're trying to normalize ALT, which reduce, uh, shows reduced hepatitis. We're trying to suppress DNA. Uh, we're trying to lose surface antigen. So really that's one of the endpoints that's been very difficult to achieve, but that is really the marker of adequate suppression. Development of surface antibody, maybe. Um, and then you're gonna see a lot of uh, this term more and more now as the newer hepatitis B therapies are being developed is this concept of functional cure. What does it mean to have a cure? Well, probably all of the above. Suppressed DNA, 
lose surface antigen, normalize ALT, maybe antibody, but any, any suppressing DNA and normalizing ALT really leads to what our main goal is, is reducing disease progression and preventing long-term complications. So I'm just going to leave it at that with terms of treatment. Um, you know, there, it's very, we can go on a lot about treatment, but I think this gives you a, a big picture about how we think about treatment approach um, with hepatitis B. So with that, uh, I'm going to jump to a summary with about four or five minutes left. Um, hopefully I've convinced you that hepatitis B is a major global burden. And I, I'm thrilled that this is an international audience and really emphasize each in your world regions, Asia Pacific, Africa, South America, really think about hepatitis B and screen for hepatitis B because you can identify these people early. And once you identify them, that's the first step. You need to plug them into care. Um, and, and that involves link, as I see here, screening them, linking them, retain, monitor, treat. So plug these people into care, assess them, monitor, and lead them into appropriate antiviral therapy. If you screen them and they don't have hepatitis B, well, as we saw in previous studies, that there's another opportunity to implement, uh, implement public health measures. You can vaccinate these people and prevent uh, future hepatitis B infection. And then most important, something I'm very passionate about, we can only we can only be successful in this is if we raise awareness and educate each other. And that's edu and things like these initiatives are so important. Educating providers, educating our students, our trainees, but also taking time to talk and educate, talk with and educate our patients to help keep them engaged uh, in their care of hepatitis B. So with that, um, Thank you everyone um, for your attention and uh, thank you for opportunity. I think there's a few minutes for questions if there are any. Thank you so much, Dr. Wang. That was a great uh, overview of hepatitis. Uh, I really like the graphs and the reminder that these, uh, these disease has a very strong uh, social component that we should be aware of. Um, I do have a question um i don't see any other questions so i'm going to go ahead with mine so once we start diagnosis and once like once you diagnose the disease and begin treatment how often do you have to follow with the, with the dna uh in order to know when to stop treatment yeah great question that's a fascinating question so you know, once I, I, once I identify these patients, not all of them need to be treated. So if they don't meet treatment criteria, I still follow these people pretty closely because there's many studies that show that even those that are not started antiviral therapy, uh, a large proportion of these people will become eligible based on flares of their DNA and based on flares of their ALT. So if they don't have cirrhosis, I monitor these people every three to six months with laboratory parameters. If they have cirrhosis, uh, those are people that really just need to be treated. Once they're treated, uh, it also depends on their disease. If they have cirrhosis already, those are people I monitor a bit more closely, probably every three months or so. If they don't have cirrhosis and they're stable on the th therapy and they've suppressed the virus, ALT is normalized, those are people you can space it out and monitor every six months. Um, and in terms of checking labs, you know, I check it once or twice a year because it's very unlikely for them to lose surface antigen. And most of these patients will need to be on lifelong therapy. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah. Does anyone else have any questions? Seems like there are no other questions. Thank you so much again, Dr. Wang. It was a great lecture, amazing. Um, thank you for your time as well. And um, yeah. Great, thank you so much, my pleasure. And uh, all of you have a great day. Um, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, <laughs> wherever in the world you are. Thank you very much.
you. Bye.